Jing, the new Chinese leadership is now firmly in place. Uh, are you expecting bold, dramatic steps, or will it be a more tentative period? Well, I think it's good news that the new leadership has been installed. Um, Uncertainty is out of the way. The next thing that people are watching is what new policies will be announced by the new leadership. We think there will be a lot of continuity in the broad macro policies. Incrementally, they're making change to make private consumption a lot more important in the economy. So in the coming days and weeks, we'll hear a lot more news about social welfare reform, medical care, uh, education, retirement services. And in addition, I think the Chinese uh, government is really trying to make this current economic recovery much more sustainable. You're referring here to what some people call a rebalancing of the Chinese economy, to put the consumer and the individual sector in a little bit more charge of their spending power and such. The downside for that, for the leadership, is that it does threaten some established interests. The state uh, en enterprises, which uh, to this point have received much of the investment funding, are they willing to take those steps? You know, rebalancing the economy is one of the um, critical challenges facing the Chinese uh, leadership. Uh, in fact, there are two aspects to rebalancing. The first aspect is to rebalance away from reliance on exports. The second aspect is actually to rebalance within the domestic economy between investments and consumption. Now, on the first aspect, China has already achieved a lot because uh, net exports are no longer contributing to GDP growth. That's been the case for 2011 and 2012. So in a way, China's growth today is uh, pretty much all driven by domestic um, economy, which is very good. Now on a second aspect, uh, rebalancing between investments and consumption, this may be a little bit more challenging because as you say, that's going to challenge some of the traditional investments by large state-owned companies, rebalancing away from that, but more towards private consumption. I would expect the rebalancing towards private consumption to take a little bit longer. Some people believe this rebalancing will necessarily involve continued slowdown in the growth of China, perhaps to a level from the current 8% as low as 5% annually. Do you see that? Not necessarily. Uh, in fact, the Chinese growth uh, is uh, gradually picking up from last year. In 2012, if you recall, we had 7.8% GDP. That was actually the lowest growth rate in a decade. Uh, quite remarkable, given the size of the Chinese economy these days. Now this year, in 2013, we're expecting GDP growth to be around 8.2%. So importantly, we need to look at where the growth is coming from. We don't expect any contribution from net exports in 2013. We expect consumption and investments to contribute equally to GDP this year. One area of consumption that is of considerable concern is residential property. There is a belief that the amount of debt involved in construction of the property, if not the actual purchase of the property, which is heavily paid for in cash, is putting some areas of the Chinese economy in danger. Is there still a residential uh, property bubble in China, and what threat does it pose? Well, the property market, I would say, is the most important sector in the Chinese economy. Um, in terms of statistics, it accounts for 10% of GDP. But in reality, I think the property market is much more important than the 10% ratio seems to suggest because there are so many related industries, you know, from commodities to home appliance sales and consumer sentiment. Everything is very dependent on property. Now, is there a bubble in the property sector? It's very hard to generalize across a country as vast as China. Um, I think in the first tier cities, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, demand is very strong and supply actually is uh, insufficient. But in lower tier cities, in third tier, fourth tier cities, you have an excess of supply and not enough demand. So of course, it's all because of different locations. Now I think going forward, the most important thing to note is that households are not heavily in debt. When they buy properties, they pay down at least 30%, 40%. And a lot of the properties are actually paid with cash. Um, on the developer side, um, banks have been actually quite reluctant to lend money to property developers. So the risks there are not overwhelmingly high, but I would think um, from a bank's standpoint, development loans to developers would be higher risk compared to mortgages to the households. As these various transitions occur in the economy, w 
from an investment standpoint, what should investors be looking at in terms of the stocks? The Chinese stocks, both the mainland and Hong Kong stocks, have been up and down over the last year. Do you see sectoral changes or a general market condition? Well, you know, investors are always looking for ways to get exposure to China's tremendous growth. I would urge investors to actually look beyond the borders of China for the best investment ideas. Uh, the Chinese stock market uh, actually was not uh, performing well uh, in 2012 or 2011. Uh, Hong Kong did better uh, because of the liquidity uh, drive uh, from the various uh, quantitative easing around the world, which affects uh, the Chinese market less, but Hong Kong more. Now, for investors who have a global perspective, they, they need to think about where China's growth is coming from. I would say the strongest growth in the coming five to 10 years will be coming from the Chinese consumer and the service sector. So to get exposure to that, they of course can look at Hong Kong China listed companies, but they also need to think broadly about global companies who can benefit from this rising consumer spending. Luxury goods companies, car companies which may be listed in the US or Europe, as well as service companies who are providing the necessary uh, infrastructure to help China build up, build up its social safety net. So to get exposure to China, you don't have to limit yourself to buying Hong Kong and China stocks. You need to think broadly about global companies that could potentially benefit from the rise of China. Because of the monetary easing policies that you refer to, there's quite a bit of worry about a possible currency war. How, how does China stand vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese, U.S. currencies, Europe and such in the, in the prospect of there being actually some kind of competitive currency devaluation? Well, a few currencies around the world um, have been devalued or have been depreciating this year against the U.S. dollar. And of course, uh, that has raised a few eyebrows uh, around the world. Um, now, China has always maintained uh, relative stability in its currency exchange rate regime. The Chinese Yuan is not freely convertible. So in a way, sometimes it's not really driven 100% by supply and demand. Uh, China's central bank keeps a relatively uh, stable exchange rate of the yuan against the US dollar. So going forward, um, for the rest of 2013, we're expecting the Chinese yuan to appreciate very mildly, maybe 2% against the US dollar. Now importantly, currency depreciation would make a country's exports more competitive. China wants to keep its exports a lot more competitive because labor cost is going up, uh, the cost of doing business in China are much higher compared to five years ago or 10 years ago. So on that front, China is really trying to boost productivity, introduce more automation into the manufacturing process, rather than let the currency depreciate to boost the export competitiveness. Optimists on the international economy point to some movement toward freer trade. There's discussion of a new US-Europe trade deal. There is the Trans-Pacific Partnership discussions in Asia, which may involve the Japanese, and at some point, potentially the Chinese. Do you see the hopes for China participating more widely in a free trade environment? Well, you know, when you think about trade, uh, we have to consider China as a major player because it is indeed the largest trading nation in the entire world. Several years ago, China surpassed uh, Germany to become the largest exporter. Uh, last year, in 2012, by some accounts, China already was the largest trading nation, having surpassed the U.S. So it's an enormous trading country, and China's uh, uh, trade uh, position has grown so much since the country opened up. Um, China itself has been undertaking um, negotiations with trading partners in Southeast Asia and elsewhere to enter into these free trade agreements. So I would say any sort of global trade pact would have to involve China, given China's tremendous position in the global uh, trade picture. Finally, Jing, is there anything about the China story at this point that you think uh, a world business audience is not focusing on enough and sh needs to think about? Well, you know, I think uh, one thing that's important is the health of the Chinese uh, financial sector. The Chinese uh, banking sector has been reformed tremendously in the last uh, 15 years. Um, many of the major banks are now listed in the overseas stock markets. 
uh, their uh, non-performing loans ratios have been uh, dropping consistently for the past uh, you know, five to seven years. Now they're actually below 1%. Uh, but importantly, we need to make sure China continues to grow, but it's not going to be a debt-driven growth model. Um, I think on that front, we need to pay a lot of attention to China's health of the banking sector, uh, as well as how Chinese banks and financial institutions can become more global in this increasingly globalized world.